It's time. Ja, det är er tid. Tid för vad? Om det res. Of course, it's time to rest, but it's also time to say thank you. Thank you aan iedereen elk wat hierdie jaar Plaas TV moontlik gemaakt het. Thank you to Plaas Media. Thank you to every company who supported us. En dankie vir elkeen wat die moeite gedoen het om met ons te kom gesels. Have a good rest and enjoy your Christmas. Geseene kersfeest, maar bly ingeskakel nog vir vandagse program. Plaas TV sal elke maandag, woensdag en vrijdag hierdie vakantie op jou kassie wees. En in 2022 is ons terug met nog landbouwnies. The main driving force behind climate change is the emission of greenhouse gases. But who or what is responsible for this? Professor Linus Franke from the University of the Free State joins us now to talk about this subject. Professor, what is the main driving force behind climate change? In principle, of course, the the climate has always been changing. But the big difference now is that the the, the climate change that we're currently seeing is induced by humans. It's caused by human activities. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the main uh, driving force behind climate change is the emission of greenhouse gases. And then the three main greenhouse gases that we have, that's carbon dioxide or CO2. Um, that's actually the biggest culprit responsible for about uh, 70% of the, the global warming effect. And then we also have methane and nitrogen oxide that cause climate change. So what basically is happening, these greenhouse gases, yeah, they form like, um, they they hinder the earth to reflect the heat back um, into space, yeah? And and because of this reduced reflection of heat, the earth is gradually warming up. And as the earth is warming up, it's, it's, it's not only causing a change in temperature, but it also has a major impact on all sorts of weather patterns. So what effect does the burning of fossil fuels have on our planet? Okay, so the, the, the main reason why car- the, the levels of carbon dioxide in the earth are, ri- are rising is because of the, the use of fossil fuels. Yeah, fossil fuels, that's basically carbon that has been fixed by plants millions of years ago by the sun as it was shining millions of years ago. And we're, uh, well, we're digging up these fossil fuels or pumping them up and we're burning them. And then the carbon that's stored in these fossil fuels is released as CO2 back into the atmosphere. So will this cause disturbance in weather patterns? What effect will this have on agriculture as well? Yeah, the, um, okay, because of the, the increase of uh, carbon dioxide and if you are the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere it gets warmer yeah and now a warmer temperature has a major impact on all sorts of other uh, weather patterns as well so what we expect in south africa um, well in the first place it gets warmer that's that's basically happening everywhere in the world um, it's not happening everywhere at the same speed um, in general the the no overall the the earth has warmed up by now by about 1.1 degrees compared to uh, pre-industrial times. Um, then um, this temperature increase is generally larger on land surfaces uh, compared to uh, the sea. And then um, if you look to South Africa, we expect that the, the warming will go faster in the interior regions of South Africa that are already warm compared to the coastal regions that have a more of a, a moderate, moderating influence from the sea. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, as the temperatures are getting warmer, also other weather patterns get disturbed. Mm-hmm. Um, rainfall patterns are being disturbed, and, and that obviously will have a, a major impact on, uh, on, on, on agriculture, especially in a relatively dry country like South Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, 
now it's a bit hard to say it's, it's very difficult what to predict what exactly is going to happen with rainfall patterns in South Africa. So overall, we expect that um, the, the, the western part of the country is likely to get drier, while the eastern part of the country could stay the same or it gets slightly wetter. But you have to be careful because it's not only about total rainfall, but it's also about rainfall distribution. And the, the expectation is that the, 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 the rainfall distribution will become more variable. Now, you can have the same amount of total rainfall in a year, but if that rainfall is more variable, so it comes in bigger showers with longer drought periods in between, that obviously will have a, a major impact on, on, on agriculture as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the third impact that people often forget is that the, 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 is the direct impact from higher levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. Because mm -hmm. higher CO2 levels has a direct impact on crop growth. And actually, it, it, it's, in general, it stimulates crop growth and it reduces water use uh, of crops. Uh, and um, what we call C3, C3 plants, they respond stronger to uh, higher CO2 levels. So C3 plants, they are plants like sunflower, soybean, potato, wheat. Yeah. And then we have the C4 plants like maize and sugarcane. They do not respond so much in terms of growth to higher CO2 levels, but they become more efficient with water um, as CO2 levels increase. Talk to us about soil health and the impact of this. Okay, now um, it, it's a bit difficult to say how well how will climate change affect soil health, <laughs> but the soil has a major role to play uh, also in the whole story of climate change. Mm -hmm. And that's because um, there is a lot of carbon stored in the soil. And then I'm not talking about the fossil fuel reserves that are deep down in the soil, but I'm talking about carbon that's stored in the upper one or two meters of the, the soil layer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is basically there's more carbon stored in the upper soil layer than there is carbon in the atmosphere and the above ground vegetation. So the, the carbon in the soil is a very important reservoir of carbon and um, it plays a major role in what we tend to call soil health, yeah? So it has a major role in, in soil functions. It improves the structure of the soil. It improves the water holding ability of the soil. Uh, soil carbon is the, the basis of all the soil life. Um, it has an important role in, in, in nutrient cycling. So carbon in the soil is incredibly important. Now, on top, on top of that, because there is so much carbon stored in the soil, mm -hmm. it's very important in the whole story of the climate change that we, in the first place, protect the carbon that's there and that we look into ways of how can we increase the amount of carbon in the soil. Mm -hmm. So basically, there's less carbon in the atmosphere. You are conducting a study on high-density graining. Won't you tell us more about this? Okay, now... Um, First of all, I mean, the rangelands are, um, are, are, are a large part of the Earth's surface are covered with grasslands, with rangelands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, obviously, these rangelands uh, represent a ma massive reservoir of carbon. And we also know very well that um, the way you manage the rangelands has an impact on the amount of carbon that's stored in the soil. Mm -hmm. Um, now, the, 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 the classical view on good rangeland management, it's always has been, um, the key focus has always been livestock numbers. That always says if, you're, if you have too, mu too much livestock, re you reduce your rangeland, re you reduce the, the growth of the, the vegetation, and you reduce the amount of carbon that's stored in the soil. That, that's all very true, but we also increasingly realize that besides the number of animals, the management of these animals actually plays in, in a very important mm -hmm. role. And we, we know it, it been, you know, we know well that if you go from, let's say, a continuous grazing system to a multi-camp system, that tends to already have major uh, benefits for the, the, the vegetation and eventually also for the amount of carbon in the soil. But now we're kind of also looking to more intense forms of management where we have high density grazing. That means that we further increase the number of animals. We have a lot of animals in small camps and the, the, the animals are rotated very quickly between camps. And then in between the grazing events, 
um, the camps are giving long resting periods. So the expectation is that um, this type of grazing um, is, is, is beneficial for the vegetation and that it also helps to store the amount of carbon in the soil. So we, we are basically at the moment, we're looking at you know, how much empirical evidence, how much real data can we get to, to, to see whether this is indeed the case or not. So, so it's, it's, it's quite an exciting development because high density grazing, um, it also allows farmers to increase basically the number of animals per unit area. Yeah, not just not just in the camp, but also on the farm as a whole, mm -hmm. because there's a better utilization of biomass. Now, if that also coincides with um, a uh, better rangeland, with a healthier rangeland and more carbon in the soil, of course, then you have a win-win situation. Is this ongoing research or what are your plans? Uh, no, it's it's ongoing research. We've, we've, we've done soil sampling. What, what we're doing is we sample soils at farms that uh, conduct uh, high density grazing and we compare it what we call an offense line contrast approach so we look for a fence line where this farmer that uh, conducts high density grazing practices borders a farm that conducts conventional practices and then we sample along the fence line um, because of course then you you have the same soil type the same rainfall and so forth but the key diff the key thing that's different is the management so that's where we hope to find uh, differences because it's actually very difficult to do research on raceland management systems because uh, that happens at a large scale it's very difficult to copy this in a replicated trial so that's why we think well it's probably more representative to look at what our farmers doing and and see how is is that management then translating into um well, into, into um, soil parameters or functions. So how, how much carbon is there in the soil? How much biological activity? Um, how is the structure affected of the soil? How is the vegetation affected by, by different management practices? Now we live in a diverse country. So this research, are you focusing on specific areas? We're doing this in the summer rainfall area of uh, South Africa. So we've got four um, sites where we've got a number of farms that we're monitoring. So mm -hmm. that's in the in the Stormberg in the Eastern Cape. It's in the Freiburg area in mm -hmm. Northwest. Mm -hmm. And then we, we're working in the Central Free State and we have some farms in the Eastern Free State. Professor Linus Franke from the University of the Free State talking to us about uh, climate change and uh, carbon and emission of gases, the influence that has on climate change. The great thing of Tai Tai is that it is where we are going to make us. Or we are going to make us better. Or we are going to make us better. Of ons genoeg omgee. Dat van altijd taaitijen is. Maar die groot ding van taaitijen is dat het ons net taaier maak. Ons stel bekend die zelfs nog taaier Hilux reeks en die splinter nieuwe Hilux legend. Miravis Neo. Sien die verschil.